listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. i got to tell you something, people. Uh, very excited to have my guest on today, because when I started out doing Cooper Talk, in the beginning, I had fellow comedians I knew back from the day, and then, then I got into a lot of actors, and I had, I had great actors, and, and I loved talking to actors. But then all of a sudden, musicians started dropping in my hands. And, and I'm not going to turn down musicians because I love great musicians. But I got an actor today, and I, I ran into him on Facebook. He was on a Cooper Talk Friends Spencer Garrett's feed, and I popped him a message. And he's, he, he has 157 IMDb credits. And if you're not familiar, familiar with IMDb, it's the uh, Internet Movie Database. And if someone has over 100, it means... They they they're, they're they got talent. So my guest is Mr. Don McManus. How you doing, Don? I'm hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Now, do you ever sit there and I know you know you've been working for a long time, even on so many shows, but do you ever sit there and look at your IMDb and go 157? I mean, it must sit there. I mean, to you, it might not seem that much, but do you ever sit there and go, man, I have accumulated a massive body of work. It's a very, it's a, it's a very strange thing, and I mean, I, I've, I've never been uh, any kind of celebrity or anything, you know. Um, and it, when you're a young actor, you're like, okay, when is, when is that, uh, when is, when is that star making role going to happen, you know? And I'm like, well, okay, I, I'm still working, working regularly, you know. And, and the thing that uh, sort of <clears throat> put it all into, into perspective for me, and, and, and made made my career make sense to me is when uh, Nick at Night came along, you know? And you'd see all of these, the reruns of all these old shows that you saw when you were a kid, right? And it's, like, the guest star would walk out and you'd go like, oh, that guy, that guy, he was in everything, man. He was like, I, I remember that. He was, oh, I love that guy. And I realized, oh, oh, that's, that's who I am. That's, and I was instantly okay with it because those actors are part of the fabric of my experience of this culture. You know, they're they're part of how I understand life as a as a guy my age in, in this location, and uh, and it just it suddenly became okay. I became totally okay with it, and also <clears throat> at some point. Um, I started getting responses from uh, from casting people like, yeah, we love Don, but uh, we want to get someone that's, that's, that's less well known. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> when, when did that happen? <laughs> so it's 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 an interesting thing, you know. Well, I always, you know, I've always compared character actors, which you are, and you uh, you work all the time. I compare character actors to. The middle of the infield on baseball, you know, the shortstop and the second baseman, or in a musician, in a band, the bassist and the guitarist. They're right. the meat and the right. bones. They're, they're the people that you need right. them to click. And without them, the whole production is going to suck. Yeah, yeah and, and honestly, <clears throat> that's, the sort of, that's the sort of thing that makes me happiest. You know, I was talking to an actor, I won't name drop, but he, he's, a, he's a really funny actor. You know, you would know him. He's also a singer. And he was saying about, uh, he was going to sing in this chorus that he volunteers with. And I said, are you, are you doing any solos? He says, no, I don't really like doing solos. I said, really? You're, in a chorus, you don't like singing solos? What's that about? He says, no, I just, I like the feeling of being wrapped up in a great big chord. And I was like, oh, I, I know what, I know what that feels like. You know, when you're on a set and the crew and the rest of the cast, everyone's like working together and you're making it together. It's a, it's a wonderfully exciting feeling. You know, you, you all get to share each other's energy. It's on. Now, how, how have you acclimated to coronavirus during acting? Because I know <laughs> auditions are not in person anymore. I know you, when you were... Right busting your chops in the beginning, everything was in person. And, you know, you live in L.A., so it's always probably great not to deal with the traffic. But how is it for you, a seasoned actor that has been, is so used to doing, in the in the room or doing that, how is it for now, if you have to do an audition, how is it for you 
taping it, is it? Do you find it easier or do you find it harder? I I I hate it. Uh, it's uh, because as well as we were saying before we started, you were talking about uh, doing these interviews in person and then doing them on phone, and phone didn't work because you were missing the the, the physical cues from the people you were interviewing, right? The same thing happens in, in an audition. Whether or not the producers and casting directors know it, they're always responding to you. There are always these micro responses that are happening in the way they sit, the way they listen, the way, you know. And if you're good at reading the room, and I, I, I think I am, then that's all information that's telling you in real time what they're looking for. You know, and two two things happen. Well, and I'll, I'll start even before, even before then. I have found at one one point I found that when I walked into an audition and you're uh, you're told go ahead and start the you know, slate whenever you're ready or they point. My first first thing I do is nothing. Just for a second, so they, so they, so they wonder what's happening, and when when I see that happen, then I start, because now I've started with their interest already. Now, now, how did you how did you learn to do that, or when did you start doing that? It was, because it was it was a mistake. It was a mistake, and I I mean I just like I realized oh they oh they're waiting for me, but by that point they were already leaning forward. And I was like oh. This is useful. This is useful because they're, but I, I elaborated on that because the feeling they have is, oh my God, what's, what's he, he's not doing it. What's he going to do? Which is exactly what you want an audience to be thinking. What's he going to do? And eventually uh, that, that changed for me into me realizing, oh, they don't know what I'm going to do. I can do anything. And so now I'm going to give myself permission to surprise myself. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so it got to be, I, I, I liked going into auditions because something I knew, I knew something unexpected was going to happen. Something I hadn't planned, something they hadn't planned. It was going to be real and live and right there. And and of course, you can't do any of that in, in a self tape audition, you know. Um, I, but I live for that kind. Of thing. Well, that isn't thing. isn't it? And I understand, and I've gotten different answers from people. But for you also, isn't it somewhat an advantage because you can do more than one take? Like you know, they always see like on, on TV, and they always they always do this, and you'll know that that probably doesn't happen a lot where someone always goes. On the TV show, oh wait, 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 wait! Can I start again? Or you know, then, yeah. oh, can I start yeah. again? Which I mean, that doesn't probably happen a lot. The casting director is like, yeah, get out. But is that is that an advantage for you sometimes if you feel like you nail a part a part more because you have more chances to nail it? Well, what, you have a chance to do it more the the preconceived way that you had in your head, but that doesn't necessarily make a great take, you know. Um, it's what I do is collaboration of beginning to end. There are actors who go in and they know what they're going to do and they do that and that's all they do. I don't, th those aren't much fun to work with, you know? And, uh, and, you know, why give that person more than one take? There's, I, I see what I do is closer to jazz than anything else. I'm, all I'm doing is listening to the other players, to the other cast members, and, and paying attention to my environment, and I'm responding to that. All of that other work is 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 been done long before I show up on set, or in the audition room, you know? And, and now, once we're there, the only interesting thing is what's happening between those people. It's the only interesting thing. So, um, I, I don't. No, if, if you're in the audition room and you get an adjustment, 
then that's then you're adjusting to a real person. That's a real that's collaborative. Just like tweaking your whatever your I don't know what it is tweaking your hair or you know I stumbled over that word. That doesn't matter. None of that matters. Um, no, I just I live to work with with other artists, and and if there's no one there, I. That's why I'm, I'm not a painter, you know. I'm not a sculptor. <laughs> I need other folks. Now, now, what made you get into acting? What kind of kid were you? Were you were you a uh, creative kid? Were you a precocious kid? Did you have a great imagination? I mean, you know, because so many times when we're younger, people will say, "I want to be an actor," but you know, the chances of people that actually follow it, you know, it doesn't happen, and that's like anything. But what what got you on this path to become an actor? Because you grew up in San Diego, right? Yeah, I've ever seen so you got the, my, you got my, the beach. Uh, I'm a Navy brat. My, I, we followed my uncle around from. I was I was conceived in uh, in Norfolk, and then my we moved with my uncle when he got moved uh, around for uh, to serve in the Navy. Um, and I was born in San Diego, um, and the, the the beginnings stories are uh, are interesting because. I apparently am a very stubborn individual. <laughs> um, and so my, my mother, I was a magician at one point, which is how I got on stage. We'll get to that in a, in a second. But uh, when I was four years old, my, my mother um, was dating this guy, and he was a magician, which is weird. Um, but it had come to my family's attention that I, I was uh, intelligent. I was already reading by the time I was four and, uh, and reading at a fairly high level. And so this guy, my mother was dating, thought out about it. He leaned down to me, he said, at my face, said, so are you going to go to Harvard or Yale? And I didn't know what either of those <laughs> words meant, but I could tell a condescending tone when I heard one. And I didn't know, uh, I didn't like the sound of the word Harvard, for whatever reason. So I said, I'm going to Yale. And um, when all is said and done, that's why I went to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true. I mean, I can, I can, I've told the stories, you know, there was, the, the drinking age was lower, the, you know, but I mean, I, I applied to Berkeley, Stanford, Yale, got into all three. And, you know, I, I didn't want to go away from home, and Yale was the farthest away. But really, if you drill down, it's because I told that guy I was going to do it, and I was going to do it, you know? <laughs> and then, and then at, when I was 11 years old, I was in sixth grade, and my teacher was this, this guy, guy changed my life, named Mr. Riley. He was... Uh, because I was smart, but, I, you know, sometimes that makes you a little different from the rest of the kids, right? And uh, he he really welcomed that. And he was a magician. And he had this after-school group of kids that would like, he would teach to do magic tricks. And, uh, and and they'd perform around Southern California. And it was it was a lot of things. It was, it was a socialization tool. It was a public speaking tool. It was just a way for kids to like express themselves. And I did that for a couple of years. And I was pretty good at it. And I was walking through Balboa Park in San Diego. And I walked past this thing called San Diego Junior Theater. And it was a bunch of kids doing a play. And I was like, well, those kids are on stage. I want to be an actor. That's what I want. I don't want to be a magician. I want to be an actor at 13. And once again, when all is said and done, that's why I became an actor. I was like, and it was a decision. I, 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 I was reading a, uh, an interview with Paul Simon. I'm a big fan of Paul Simon. Really good. Um, and this is like 10 years ago. So he's like 70, I guess. And he said, I, I decided I wanted to be a, a songwriter. And I think he said when he was like 11, uh, said I want to be a songwriter when I was 11. And it recently occurred to me 
that I don't have to do what an 11 year old wants if I don't want to really anymore. And it, it, it does occur to me, you know, a 13 year old made my life choice, made my career choice. And every now and then I go, should I still be listening to that 13 year old? Is it, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's other stuff in the world, but the, the problem, and I think about it a lot. Um, because I love I love science I I love I love school in general. Um, and one of the reasons that I think I stuck with acting is it's the hardest thing I've ever encountered. It's the hardest thing I've ever tried to learn how to do because there are no real guideposts after a certain. And, and and that excites that, that excites me. I just I love do the, the business is a whole other thing. The business that you know we have to deal with is not a lot of fun. But doing what I do is the most fun I have in my life. Now, when you went to Yale, did you go as an acting major, or did you have another major when I, you went there? I I got. I got scholarships to go, first of all, and I specifically got a, uh, a physics scholarship. So I entered in, in a, as a combined major in physics and philosophy. And, uh, and I w- the, the way they were teaching, I was, I was studying uh, the math part in the engineering school and, uh, um, the teacher just was not engaging at all, and I just wasn't, I wasn't connecting at all. And at the same time, all of the deconstructionists were visiting Yale, the, uh, the literary critics, the deconstructionists. They were either teaching there or they were visiting, and I started taking comparative literature classes with them. And they were, they were geniuses. I, I'd never heard anyone with such fantastic ideas. And so I changed majors, and I ended up uh, <clears throat> getting a combined major in, in theater studies and conflict. So it was, it was quite a sudden turn, you know. Um, I was just having an argument on social media the last couple of days with someone saying, uh, you know, if, if we didn't have to take all the stupid classes we didn't want to take as an undergraduate, we could get out a lot sooner and a lot cheaper. Well, that wouldn't have worked for me at all. You know, because I went in to, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I went in and found out things that like, opened up whole words that I didn't even, I had no clue were there. And to me, that's the point of an education. To like, to have your, your world just opened up so you can take a different path. Well, it's funny you say that because I went to a small state school in New Jersey called Stockton State College. Now it's Richard Stockton University. And right. I ended up like freshman year because back then, you know, you got screwed with, with classes when you were a freshman. You know, you had to pick them out. And I ended up having death and grieving and volcanoes, which I look back now, <laughs> volcanoes, I still remember. All I remember is two things. The two types of lava are Aha and Pahoya. And I remember a guy I knew decided he asked, you know, I don't know anything about this. Can I cheat off you? And I'm like, I don't care. And I remember I changed one answer. And he that's the only answer he answered on his own. And I changed it. It was wrong. And he was right. And I got a 96 and he's got a 98. And that's, oh, the, only well, thing, that's the only thing I remember from volcanoes. That's just weird how you remember that stuff. though. It is. It is crazy. Now, yeah. when, you, when you got out of college, how did you start your career? Because, you know, it's like, you know, it must look good when you have a Yale degree because it's got a it's got a good it's got a good name. But did you what did you want to do? Did you want to do theater? Did you want to do movies probably back then? Because a lot of people weren't as much into TV back then. Right. What did you want to do? What was your goal plan? Um, when, when, when I got out of school, I stayed in New Haven an extra year. And I did things like manage restaurants and get engaged. And none of those things worked out. Um, and, uh, and I was afraid to go to New York because new, new, that, that's the natural move, right? New, new Haven's New York. I was, I was too, 
I was too scared to do that. So I went back home and I figured I'd, I'd do theater around town in San Diego. And I did do that. Um, and I was, I was working at a bar, um, and I had this regular, this attorney that came in and he was, he was looking glum one day and I'm doing like the mop in the bar up and go, Hey Joe, <laughs> what's going on? He's like, ah, I, I'm, I, I need some help in the office. I'm like, really? What do you do? He said, well, I'm a patent attorney. And, uh, I said, Oh really? What, what do you need? What do you need? I said, well, I just need someone to write patent applications. I need someone that, uh, you know, has a, a, a strong science background. I said, well, you know, I, uh, I, I started uh, school in physics. Uh, and he said, really? That's, that's weird. That's, he said, Did you, can, can, can you write? And I said, well, I graduated in comparative literature. And he said, where'd you go to school? And I said, Yale. And he, and he said, can you be in my office on Monday, Monday morning? So I was. And, um, I started writing patents instead of attending bar and I made like, I mean, the money was crazy back then. It was like, this is early eighties. And I think I was making 50 bucks an hour doing this, you know, as, as, as opposed to making tips. And, but I was still work doing theater around town. And I was, I auditioned for the old globe to be an apprentice in their, in their program. And, uh, the same week, the, the attorney I was working for offered me a free ride through law school. If I would give their firm three years after I graduated and the old globe offered me $125 a week to apprentice for them. And so I took the job at the old globe and, uh, My parents, man. My <laughs> man. <laughs> they just, they, yeah, yeah, they didn't. Um, but I, 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 I have an oddly intellectually conservative streak, and I, and I don't mean that in you know, any political way. Um, but I always thought that. In order to learn how to break the rules, you first had to learn the rules, right? You first had to learn how to do this stuff. And so that, and that factored into Yale, if I'm going to Yale, if I'm being honest, because I figured that's school where you're going to learn how to do things the right way. And uh, so when I started working at the Old Globe, I thought, okay, I'm going to do classical theater. I'm going to learn how to do classical theater. That's where it is. And I did. And I, you know, I went on and I did other classical theater in, in New York the New York Shakespeare Festival and stuff. But that's what started. I did, uh, started working at the Old Globe, did other stuff around San Diego. I was in a play called Holy Ghost by Romulus Linney that got scouted by this group called the American Theater Exchange. The whole production got moved to New York off Broadway. And, um, and I sort of got singled out. Of the, it's an ensemble play. I sort of got singled out and I got signed uh, there and haven't done anything else since. That was in 87. Now, when did you start parlaying that into TV and movies? I mean, what was that What was that uh, path? Because, you know, a lot of theater actors love theater so much, but then they shortly find out that you can't make a lot of money doing theater and it's hard to live. And, you know, when did you start going the TV movie route. Well, I didn't. I, I, I was I was one of those guys that just wanted to do theater. I, I wasn't looking to do anything else. Really. And then I, uh, <clears throat> back in the day, there used to be a thing called pilot season. It was a time of the year where all the pilots were cast. Is the early part of the year, January, February, and so people would show up. It was like hunting season. People would show up in Los Angeles and all try out for these these pilots, right? So I, I I did that, and while I was there, I think my first job in Los Angeles was in L.A. Law, and then I got cast um, 
because another actor uh, backed out of the role, I got cast as a as a a, a guest star that turned into a recurrence role on the show Northern Exposure, and uh, and you know that's a long time ago for your listeners that don't know it. Um, it was a sort of you. It was a fish out of water story. This guy from New York shows up in Alaska, and there are all these strange people. It's a fish out of water story, but it's also a kind of utopian vision because all these oddballs get along no matter what. And this guy named this actor named Doug Ballard and I were the gay couple on the show. And it's just hilarious to me the the joke as far as I could determine was that we didn't act gay. That was like, that was, that was the whole joke, you know? And they, they kept adding uh, features to our characters, you know, to, to, uh, uh, the second time we showed up, we found out that we were Marines. Um, The third time uh, we showed up, we had backgrounds in archeology. span um, and then, it, then like, then I think Doug uh, spoke Korean. Uh, it was like it just kept adding these things to us, but it, but it didn't matter because we were because we were gay. That was that was what we were. No matter what else you added to us, we were gay. I was talking to a friend of mine while I was doing the show, and he was telling me we think you guys are just hilarious. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Can, why? What's they're like, well, you were at the bar, and you know, it's, it's this guy ordered beer, this guy ordered a shot, and you ordered a glass of white wine, and we just started laughing. It's like, oh, I, oh, I see, because white, because white wine's gay. Oh, I see, perfect. But, uh, there was such a, a lesson to me in once you're viewed a certain way, once a character's viewed a certain way, it it, it stays that way, you know, and everything gets seen through that lens, and it was kind of it was odd. But then, and, and in the course of doing this show, I moved from New York to Los Angeles. Right? A couple of years later, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm an actor recurring on a show. And I get buttonholes. I walk down the street in West Hollywood with people saying, you know what? Um, thank you for Northern Exposure because... You helped me come out of the closet. I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, bonus. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I can't speak for anyone else, but as a character actor, I don't, I don't, I don't ever think of, of myself as having much impact on the world at all. You know? Um, I do, I, but sometimes it feels, I feel a little embarrassed because I have friends who are doctors and, uh, you know, lawyers who are doing great things for society. I'm, I'm, I'm acting, I'm playing. Yeah, but you, you know, I mean, that's the thing. And that's, you know, so many actors I talk to are so humble, you know, and, and that's true. I mean, I was going to say, you know, look at your role in Seinfeld. You know, you, that's an icon. And, and you know, at my age, I'm, I'm 57. And I, I watched Seinfeld when it came out. And right. and now when you watch it, you know, it, it's like, oh, if they had a uh, if they had a cell phone, the episodes right. wouldn't happen. But right. it's still right. funny. And I've talked to friends of mine. My friend Stuart said how his kids, they watch it and they dig it because it's it's nostalgic to them. Like it's it's yeah. it's not, you know, but that's the thing with actors like you're rolling Seinfeld of Duncan. Everyone remembers the race. I mean, it's yes. something that people, and so you do make a difference. And that's what I always laugh at with an actor is they go, we don't make a difference. Well, yeah, you do. The same way that you can hear a song from someone, like we talked about Springsteen on Facebook very quickly, you know, how right, me right, growing right. up in New Jersey, when I hear a song, it makes me think of something. It's same with actors. And a lot of actors like you do right. not ever sit there and go, yeah, holy crap, people, people remember that. Yeah, it's weird. A, f- a few years, several years after I was on Seinfeld, my wife and I uh, were on this cruise, one of the only cruise we ever went on, the Northwest Passage. Um, and we're in the, we're getting food, you know, we're in the dining hall. And I kept hearing, Duncan! Duncan! I was like, who's calling? And I 
friends that then looked like they were looking at me. I was like, where should I think? They think I'm someone named Duncan. I don't know who that... And it turned out Duncan Myers was the name of the character from Seinfeld. And they were like, finally someone came up to me and said, you're Duncan Myers. I was like, what are you talking about? Duncan Seinfeld. I was like, oh yeah. That was, oh yeah, that was that guy's name. I forgot about that. In the same way that when I was in, um, I was in this movie called The Shawshank Redemption. And I'm like, I'm the only nice prison guard in the, in, in the, in the thing. And I'm, and I'm kind of punished for, for my naivete by, by Tim Robbins. But, um, I leave him alone in the, in the office for a minute while I go to the bathroom. And what I say to him now, I'm going to go pinch a loaf. And when I get back, this place better be cleaned up. Right. For, um, for years, people would walk up to me on the street and say, I got a pinch of loaf. And I'm like, why would you say, why, what is that? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I finally someone had to explain it to me. That's what you said. I was like, oh, oh, yes. I didn't think that would be a timeless remark. <laughs> now, you know, I got to ask you this. You know, Northern Exposure, Seinfeld, and Shawshank Redemption all were around the same time. Yeah, did, did yeah. that did that kickstart your career? I mean, not kickstart. You were always working, but did that make you more in demand? Because also they were. Different, they were all different roles. You have the top sitcom, you have an Oscar-nominated movie, you have a gay character when there wasn't a lot of gay characters in a very right, right, right. cult, like a, I mean, Northern Exposure was, had a cult following, you know, people who dug it, it was like, I like the show, intelligent people like that show. Did that help you start to get work all of a sudden where people said, we know you, like when you walked into a, an audition or a casting director, oh, we know that guy, he's in this, this, and this. Kind of the opposite. Because, um, as you say, they were all different, and um, it was it was not the time for the versatile act. At that time, it was still kind of old school. You were you were like an, an Italian mug, or you were a cowboy, or you were a suit, or you were a cop. You were you were a type, and I wasn't any of those types. And it, in fact. I remember um, going into an audition <laughs> and finishing the audition and the casting director just laughing, just like burst out laughing. He said, that's why I bring you in, because I know you're not going to do it like anyone else does. I was like, oh, okay. But that's like, but okay, so if you're a director and a casting director, that's not, you don't, you don't pencil out. Oh, this guy that's going to do something I don't expect. That's like, that might be bonus, but that's not how you plan it. So for years, I got almost all of my jobs after they couldn't find the guy. <laughs> right? It was like, I would, and, and I would, also for years, I, I'd walk into a room and there'd be like two guys who were a definite type. And I would go, oh, I, I get it. I, I'm I'm the other choice. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> let's, let's, I'm I'm the other way to go. And that's how that's how my career came to be. It's sort of you know I, I, I kind of surrounded and strangled my career is what is what happened. I, I crept up on it from the outside by doing all of these these different roles. You know, um, for a long time, I, 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 I described my roles as the, the and yet character, you know, he's a really nice guy and yet he's a serial killer, um, or, you know, or he's a really mean guy and yet he really loves his daughter. It, it was, it was, it was always some, you know, second act head fake going on. Now, what was it like for you, you know, you look as I look at IMDb, you know, Party of Five, um, NYPD Blue, you're getting these recurring roles, you know, maybe mm -hmm. three or four. What is that like as an actor when you're sitting there and you're recurring and then you're going to another set? Is it frustrating sometimes because you're not getting that series? Or is it something that you go, I love this because I'm getting to flex my chops all these different ways? Well... There, it's, it's hard to overstate how comforting it is 
to have a regular place to go to work, you know, to have a parking spot outside the stage is, is a really comforting feeling. Like, oh, this is my place. This is where I go. This is where I go to work. This is my family. That's a good thing. Um, and, and I think in some ways a recurring or arc character gets the best possible part of that. Because I've worked on a number of shows where if I'm recurring and I'm in the script, they're bringing me in because they want to use me. You know, I'm, I'm not just, I'm not just there in the background. If you're a regular, a lot of times you're just there because you're part of the set, you know? And if something is shot in, in the, this room, all the people that work in this room have to be there whether or not they have anything to do. So you can be a, a regular on a TV show and actually have a pretty unsatisfying experience. Um, if I'm recurring and they're using me, I know they want me to be there. Um, and it's also... TV's very different now than it used to be. Um, and now regulars on a, on a TV show often have really crazy arcs. That didn't used to be the case. But now on shows like Shit's Creek, you know, where the first season, they're all just arrogant, stuck-up assholes. And over the course of the show, you see these people grow souls. You see them become human beings. It's this fabulous arc. On Breaking Bad, um, the central character has a has a crazy character arc. In old school TV, um, series regulars didn't evolve. You know, they were the same from the jump. And but a recurring character, someone who's written in, is he's written in to have an arc. He's meant to change over the course of this, and the regulars are the ones changing him. Right? That's he's how you measure the. the action of the piece and so that's always interesting so it's even it's more exciting when you're hired as as a one-off and they go hey you want to do a couple more which means that you've piqued the writers and producers interest and they go like I, i've i got something i want to do for this for this character i saw something there and so immediately you're in a collaboration with these writers, you know, they give you something and you're like, okay, I see what they're going for here. And you take it a little farther and that, that excites them further. And so then you're really growing this character together. That's a lot of fun. Now, you know, when you look so, I mean, when you look at your resume, you know, you've been on so many great shows, you know, 24, NCIS, Rescue Me. You know, what is it like when you go on these sets where you know... It's a well-oiled machine as an actor. And I talk to people who say sometimes they go on the sets and they get to work and they go and they go, this sucks. You know, and sometimes they go on the writing's so great, they go, wow, this is awesome. Right, what is it right. like when you get on that set? Like The Shield, you know, and Sean Ryan's been on my show and I love that show. Or Rescue Me, you know, was a great. What is it like when you get on a show that you know it's going to be well-written stuff? Well, um, first of all, one of the, one of the, the really great things about about having done as many shows as I've done is that for the most part when I walk on a television set I'm probably going to know about a third of the group and so I'm so the, the, the extended Hollywood family is already there and that's nice you know um, and and I don't know. As I, as, I was, as I was saying, I just I, when something is really working well, when a crew really works well together, it's just thrilling. And then all you got to do, all you got to do, is make everyone else's job easier, and you're gold. You know, I if something if, if tempers are getting short on a set, and you know we're not getting a take, uh, not getting a shot. Um, and I feel like people are looking for a place to blame. I will always say, I, I can explain it. I, I screwed that up. 
I, I did. That was that was me. You know, let's go get. And then you know, and everyone knows what I'm doing. And everyone goes like, okay, thank God, someone like took the hit for that. You know, and you've all, and you've definitely made a friend of the of the person who screwed it up. Um, <laughs> you know, but I also like uh, talking directly to the, the operators and saying, just tell me how I help your how I can help your shot. You know, because I've done it long enough. That's not even making a physical adjustment for camera or something. It's something I can do. It's like a piano player not worrying about their left hand. You know, um, it's just something I can do very easily. And so, if I can, why not help these people that we're all making this thing together? With? It's it, I, I it, it's so you're an actor, and that and that's and and I always talk to actors, and acting is acting when they get on set. For you, do you feel any difference in preparation for a comedy or a drama? Or is it all, do you all look at it, do you look at it as the same way? Because, you know, I know a lot of times my background in the 80s, I was a touring stand-up comic all over the East right, Coast. Right, right. And comics I know who are friends, you know, sometimes they, if they get on a sitcom or they get an audition, they always try to make it funny instead of just delivering it, which the writing is already funny. How do you prepare... When you're preparing, when you're running your lines in your head, is the preparation the same for a drama as it is for a comedy? Or when you do a comedy, do you have that idea that goes, you know, I I have to deliver the laugh? Well, the... It's a little bit of both. I mean, the... the uh, you have to be honest in both of them. You can't... There's, there's a kind of goofy sitcom acting that I don't do, you know? Um, I, I can make strange physical choices, you know. Um, uh, like a, the, the first episode I did of Mom, I was playing a uh, a uh, an attorney who was in in recovery, um, and also high as a kite, and um, and it led to some some, some kind of twitchy uh, <laughs> physical choices. Um, but I hope it was, it was still attached to some truth. I think that I tend to find comedy in in rhythms and in and in attitude. I can you can be telling someone something just awful and embarrassing about yourself, and then in the in the middle of it, um, make a different choice, which is funny. It's not a big broad. It's just the it's change of the rhythm that like that, that makes people respond physically, which is the, the start of the laugh, right? That's how you. To me, that's the, the difference. But it's not. I, I'm not like um, a movie I did. Ted Melfi called The Starling, starring uh, Melissa McCarthy, is coming out in September. And um, and I've it's just one scene, and I've seen the scene because we had to do uh, looping on it, right? Uh, ADR, and I think it's the funniest thing I've done, maybe ever. But it's played. I played it just like. What's funny about it is that both Melissa and I are playing it so serious that it's that it's ridiculous, you know. And that's and we just improv that all. That's all I did was improv with Melissa McCarthy all day long. And I mean, come on! I know. I, I was going to say. I was going to say. I was also going to say about Mom. I mean, you got to work with uh, Anna Faris, and uh, and I, I I can't believe I'm not thinking Alice and Janney. Yes, who Alice and Janney yeah. is just amazing as a dramatic and a serious. What is that like for an actor when you get to go? It's, it's I always compare it to. It must be like a guy who gets traded to a team and he's playing next to Derek Jeter. You know, like a second, like yeah. you're going, what was that like when you went on set? Did you just know that, I mean, and did you know either of them before? Well, I had to know I did not know either of them before. Um, I, I, had, I had worked with Chuck Lorre before um, on, on other shows, on, on, and I can't remember, can't even remember which one's done. Um, but, um, I, I, and, I, and I hadn't, before I did Mom, I hadn't done a sitcom at least seven years, maybe ten years. 
And that's all I did when I first came out to LA sitcoms. But I hadn't done one in a long time. And I remember telling um, Betty Gordetsky, um, I'm, I'm nervous. I haven't done this in a long time. I don't know. And he told me a great, great thing. Uh, he said, first of all, it's good that you're nervous. Because that means you're not a hack. It means you're not just going through the motions, right? You care. Good. Um, secondly, we're not going to let it be bad. If something's not working, we're going to change it. It's not, it's, it's not working inside of the script. Is it working? The blocking isn't working. The camera isn't working. Or, or an, an attitude isn't working. Don't just change it. That's it. And he took all of that anxiety away. Because that was such a, a grown-up way to look at the work. You know? Um, and then working with... I first mainly worked with Anna. And I was doing a scene with her in, in this, you know, this 12 step meeting and we're very close and the camera's a ways away. It's, it's a wide shot, you know, and we're, we're talking and she's asking me for a favor. And I looked in her eyes and there was this like, this little broken girl thing in her eyes she was doing. And we, we, we got, got the shot and we moved on. And I said, did you just give that to me in a master? Did you just give that to me when the camera couldn't even see you doing that? You fucking rock. And she <laughs> <laughs> So we hit it up right away. And then and then Allison, I mean, her 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 set of tools is so broad and so deep. It's a it's so much fun. You're just Wow. She's something. She's something. And also, she's uh, she's she's tall enough to play opposite me, so that's great. Yeah, Alice, Jenny, Janet McTeer is the other one that I have worked with. It was height appropriate. Now, through your career, was there any moments where you were acting with someone where you were like, "Wow," like you know? I mean, I get that. Like we talked briefly when I got to interview Stephen Van Zandt, I was like, yeah. "Wow!" Like you sit there and you're going, "Wait a second, I'm on Zoom with this person for an hour." Have yeah. you had any where you walked into the set and you were like, wow. And on the other hand, have you ever had any where you walk onto the set and you're a little bit intimidated? Oh, 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 I did. One of the, one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. And I'm fortunate because it came not too long, came kind of late. Uh, was a movie called Vice that Adam McKay directed about Cheney. And... I walked on the set and, and you know, there's Christian Bale and Amy Adams and, you know, all, and, uh, and, um, Steve Carell. And just, I mean, it's just, it's just packed with movie stars, you know? And I was like, okay, just don't screw up. Don't screw up. Um, and the, um, actually it was kind of funny. I, I played this lawyer called, named David Addington, and there was only one piece of footage of him on the internet to be found. He just did not like being in front of the cameras. But that helped me. And then the first day up, there was a... Uh, my first scene was them introducing my character, and the as it's written, we're looking through the outside of a second-story window into an office, and I'm pacing around with these two other guys and we're, we're planning something, but it's voiceover and I'm inside the office. And I was like, okay, so I don't have to say anything in my first scene. So that's okay. Good, good, good. And, uh, I'm sitting down in makeup and they're doing all this. Takes a while. And we go, no, Adam McKay, he used to, uh, he used to run SNL. And he was he was partnered with Will Ferrell for years, and I know on those and those, and he, I, I'm gonna guess there's some improv going on here. And so I I, I looked into what Adam had written, and it was a uh, reference to uh, a, a, a unitary. Uh, 
executive, uh, where the, the president is, is the one in charge and, and the executives should be uh, a, a supreme power, basically. And so I, I looked through that and said, that's interesting. And so I just memorized uh, that section of the Constitution just so I would have, because apparently this guy also always carried the Constitution in the pocket. And I was like, so it, I'll have something I can refer to if I have to say a word or two, you know. And I'm walking to set, and uh, sure enough, it's lit from outside. And I walk past the sound guy. He says, hey, uh, Don, let me, uh, let me mic you. I'm like, okay, so there's dialogue. Okay, so I am going to have to say something. And we, uh, we walk inside, and, and there's track laid for the, the camera doll inside the office. I'm like, Oh, this is all dialogue. Oh, this is, uh, okay. So, hmm. And um, the first AD walks up to me, first assistant director walks up to me and says, uh, the director, Adam, would like to talk to us. So I go and talk to him. He's like, you know, I just want some, I just want some improv here. Uh, I want you to talk about, um, I, want you to, I want you to talk about uh, the War Powers Act. And he gave me like four or five different, constitutional law ideas to talk about. And I'm like, okay, all right. No, so I'm going to improvise constitutional law. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, so we go in, and I'm working with these two guys, and I'm just, and fortunately, I have a great memory. And uh, I, we would roll out whole mags of film. I, we'd do like 10 minutes of of improv or, or more about constitutional law. And I, and then he'd call me back between takes and he'd say, okay, now add this, add this. I go back and I did, we said, I, I, I improv constitutional law for like four hours that day. And, and then I did another scene. And after I did that, uh, Adam called me over and said, I want you, I'm going to introduce you to this, this guy here. And he introduced Introduces me to the executive producer, and um, so, and um, then I get ready to do my next scene to like make a wardrobe change, and I got into my trailer, and uh, I get a call from uh, my manager, who says, "I don't know what you did, but I just got a call from the casting director because the producer called the casting director to say." to thank her for hiring you because of the work you're doing. And I was like, oh, that's, that's awesome. And I go and, and we do the next scene and we have, I have a great time doing that scene. And I go home and I'm just on cloud nine until I get into bed that night and I go, well, what am I going to do tomorrow? What am I, what, this is, how do I, I can't do that every day. That's just not, but I have to say, every day was that exciting, and that, and Adam just knew how he knew how to ask me to do the right things that would bring things out. Oh you know? I, yeah, I, I when we when I did stand up, I used to hang out with Adam in Philly years ago oh, before he got it, you know. and he was just you know he was just such a. His ideas were so, I mean, later a lot of them showed up in Anchorman. Like stuff, the, the terms he was using, like gun show and stuff like that, he was yeah. using on stage. And he's always very, he's an imposing figure. He's, you're a tall guy. I'm a yeah. tall guy. So, okay, I got to ask you. I, I was looking through senior moment. You're on a really great cast with that. I look at, I mean, that's like, you look at that cast, you go, William, well, Gene Smart, who is like, the hottest thing out there right now. But what is it yeah. like when you go into a set with a cast like that? Because you got Shatner, you got Gene Smart, you got a ton of people. Um, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell you a story that it does not, it's not that cast, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's illustrative, I think. Um, I, I, as I, was, I mentioned, I was working with Janet McTeer. And a couple of years ago, there was this show uh, called uh, Jessica Jones, the Marvel comic book hero kind of thing. And there was this uh, 
character actors, recurring character actors, played the mother of, of the lead. And I was like, and I was like, this actress is fantastic. And I'm calling upstairs, my wife going, what's this, this actress on the show is just amazing. And I, I wait to find out her name. And I said, well, Marcia, do you know Janet McTeer? My wife goes, Don, Don, everyone knows who Janet McTeer is. She's, she's a genius. <laughs> and I was like, and she's like one Tony's, you know, on stage. And, and, uh, and so I get cast uh, in this, this this thing called Sorry for Your Loss, where I play uh, an estranged father and husband to the lead character, to the estranged father to the lead character. And um, and my ex-wife is Janet McTeer. And all of my scenes are with Janet McTeer. And I've just spent the last year singing her praises and telling my wife how much I'm... And so we, we get... We, we get together for the first scene. Uh, so you want to run them? Want to run the lines? Uh, yeah, okay, run the lines. And, uh, they're lighting and we're waiting while they light. And I've got a pretty good deadpan. And I told her, um, I'm really intimidated and terrified. And she, she laughs and she, yeah, I can tell. And I was like, Oh, okay, this is going to go. This is going to go fine. This is, you know. But I think, I think, um, you just have to, you just have to get over all of it immediately. You just, ha- it just, uh, you know, William Shatner's William Shatner, and 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 I've been a fan since I was a kid, right? But not on the set. On the set, he's just another guy. He's just he's just another actor, and we're all doing our jobs. As uh, you know, then then when I go home, I can fanboy all I right. want. But you know, but That's- it was funny. We shot it in Palm Springs, and it was it was shot for for nothing. And my character is the most outrageous ambulance chaser on the planet. It's like. I, I didn't really have to act much because my, my wardrobe did most of the acting for me. Um, uh, no, I, I, but you know what? I've been, I've been lucky. I've worked with just amazing people. You know, I'm trying to remember who played the male lead in three billboards. In what? In three billboards. The, um, Oh, I can't believe I'm, I'm not. Fran McDormand was starred in it, and he played this this like racist cop. Um, I can't. I, he played George Bush in Vice, um, and I saw him in three billboards outside of wherever it was. Um, and after I saw the movie, I thought. I'm so glad I did not see this movie before I worked with him because it was a masterclass. I mean, he's, he's brilliant. And I would, I, I think I would have been too intimidated to work with him if I'd seen that first. And by the way, I was also in scenes with Christian Bale. So, uh, if, you know, um, <laughs> well, no. Don, I, I want to thank you for taking the time today, man. I, I love, <sighs> I love talking to actors because you have so many stories. You've had such a good career and you've worked with so many people. And I always say, you know, I mean, the character actors, they, they have their ups and downs, and that's the thing. But but yeah. the guys who stay with it, like Spencer Garrett had said years ago, like, there was 800 of us in a room. And then when you get yeah. to 30, there's two, you know, and then by the time you get to 50 or 55 or 60, there's, like, 20 of you left and, yeah. and because you did it. And that's what's amazing about you guys because, as I said, you guys are the backbone of, of, of the industry. And we all know each other. And, you know, when you're young and you're very competitive, you're like, ah, screw that guy. I, I want that. You know what? I'm, if, I typically, no one's walking into audition rooms anymore, but before the pandemic, I'd walk in, I'd see Spencer, I'd see, and I'm like, oh, that, just just swing a cat. Any one of us. It doesn't matter. Good. And and I will feel great about anyone, anyone who gets it. Because at this point, they're my friends, you know? Well, that's awesome, man. I want to thank you. And are you on Twitter? I know you're on Facebook. Are you on Twitter? 
I am on Twitter. I, I don't, I don't do it much, but, uh, um, cause boy, that gets mean spirited fast. Um, <laughs> but I guess uh, Facebook does too sometimes, but, um, no, but I am on Twitter. You can, you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Facebook. Um, uh, is, is there anything I have to, pick? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, see the starling in, uh, in September. Ted Melfi's movie with, with Melissa McCarthy. So people check him out and go to go to his IMDb, Don McManus. Just look at all the stuff he's been in, and then you know what you do? You go back and you watch some of that, and you go, "Wow, that, that guy's Excellent. great!" And so people also uh, go to my website. It's CooperTalk.net. You can find over eight hundred and sixty-five episodes. Email me Cooper at CooperTalk.net. Twitter it's at CooperTalk. Instagram it's at CooperTalk One. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.